a great day to be in church. It's a great day to be alive. And it's really a good day to be here because today we're continuing a series that we've been in for the last couple of weeks called Inquiring Minds. And we actually put this out to you guys. We put some, let's call them some hot topics out to you guys and said, why don't you vote on the things that you want to hear about? And so Pastor Jeff's been tracking with us for the last couple of weeks. And the third most popular thing that you guys wanted to hear about was politics. What a great week to talk about that, right? And they gave it to the one guy with the accent. My accent alone makes me 20% more cancelable. I don't know how that works. It just somehow does, right? But we're going to discuss all things politics. And more importantly than that, and what we've done all throughout this series, is we're going to not just talk about this idea, but we're actually going to open up the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about politics. And one of the things that we've tried to say throughout this entire series is, is because we have like multiple opinions and multiple people in rooms, is we're going to sort of curb our amens. We're typically a, a church that talks back to people. We actually, as guys on the platform, we kind of get some energy out of that. But hey, out of respect for everybody, we're going to hold that. And, uh, and I'll just say this, take more notes if you don't know what else to do, all right? That's just kind of a good way to think about it. Because today, we're going to talk about what, what's the church's role in politics. Like, hey, how should we vote? And for some of you, we'll answer the question, does it even matter anyway? Is it all just going to hell in a handbasket? Like, does it even matter? And it, we're, we're going to dive into that. And here's what we need to understand up front is when it comes to something like a, a topic this, this hot, everybody has an opinion. Everybody, I don't know if you've realized this or not, but everybody has an opinion. Just go on Facebook right now, and you will see three or, three or 20 of them, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to open up the Bible, and we're going to find out what God's opinion is on it. As Pastor Jeff has said the last few weeks, is that our opinion bows to God's authority. So what does God have to say about it? Before we jump into it, I just want you guys to know, I need to set some ground rules, okay? I grew up in a wildly patriotic, like, flag-flying home. Like my, my raising was basically a living country song. That's kind of the way I was raised. Toby Keith belongs on Mount Rushmore because of one song, all right? If you don't cry every time that the, the cymbals clash on Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA, you're not only not a patriot, you might not be a Christian. That's just the way that we were raised. That's the way I thought. I grew up loving our country. I'm, I'm still amazed by the freedoms that we have. I still, and just want to say this publicly, honor those who served, fought for, and died for our country. It is like deep within me. So because of that, just a couple of ground rules that I want to say to you guys as we get started. One is that today, you will get uncomfortable. <laughs> you will. And that's a good thing because every once in a while, we need to hear some stuff that we may disagree with. That's a good thing. And you're going to probably hear that today. We also need that in our lives. We need sometimes some things that we read from the Bible that are maybe a little bit controversial because they bump up against our opinion. Because at the end of it, if we do that, we'll get better because of it. Here's the second ground rule, all right? I'm going to ask you guys to actually play along and repeat this after me as we get started. Ready? Here we go. We love Kevin. Ready? Everybody go. We love Kevin. All right, y'all better have said that loud in Porter's Neck, all right? We just got to remember those things as we jump in. Well, as we go in, we're going to go right into the Bible, and we're going to dive into what God has to say about politics. And if you have your Bible, you can open it up with me to the Gospel of John. And Jesus, when he was on the earth, he was actually pressed multiple times on this issue of politics. In fact, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was taken to one of the political leaders of that day, this guy named Pilate. And Pilate brought Jesus before him, and he asked Jesus his position on the political world right then and there. And in John chapter 18, verse 34, listen to what Pilate asked Jesus. It says, Pilate then went back inside the palace. He summoned Jesus to him, and he asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Essentially what he's saying is, are you the leader of this group? Here's another way of saying, Jesus, which side of this deal are you on? Where do you stand? What are you for, and what are you against? And Jesus makes a statement after a few minutes, and it's a statement I think is going to not only remind us of where he stands, but I'm going to use this statement as the thing that sets the tone for everything we're going to talk about this morning. In verse 36, Jesus says this, when it comes to Jesus' political stance and where he's at and when it comes to being a Democrat or a Republican, where he's at when it comes to political issues, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were then my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. Maybe another way to say this is, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would post aggressively and angrily on Facebook. Not that that hits close to home for anybody. But he says, but now my kingdom 
is from another place. Everybody say this with me. Across every campus, say another place. Jesus says, my kingdom is not from here. You see, we're in a world that's asking which side is Jesus on. And Jesus establishes right up front something that's crucial for us to be reminded, reminded of. Is Jesus, he steps on the scene and he says, I want to remind you that I'm a part of a kingdom that's greater than any kingdom that you could be a part of. That I'm building something on the earth that's bigger than any one person, and I, it's bigger than any person you're going to vote into an office, and it's bigger than any policy that you want to see passed. Jesus says, I'm here to set up my kingdom on the earth. I love Pastor Tony Evans. He says it this way, is that Jesus didn't come to take sides, he came to take over. I just kind of love that, that thought. And it leads us to the question that, that you go, Kevin, that's, that's great. Like I, I hear that in the Bible, but, but it still comes down to this question of who does Jesus want to win? Right, like I, I'm an Enneagram three, I like to win. I have the spiritual gift of winning. Who does Jesus want to win? Does he want it to be an elephant or a donkey, Biden or Trump? Like who does Jesus want to win? Jesus has an opinion. I do need you to know this. Jesus has an opinion. And according to what we read, Jesus says, Jesus' opinion, not only in this instance of the, the scripture, but all throughout the Bible is that the person and the people that Jesus wants to win, he wants the church to win. You see, Jesus, when it comes down to it, it doesn't mean that we don't get political. It doesn't mean that we don't vote. It doesn't mean that we don't care. But what we have to understand is that Jesus says, my kingdom is not from this world. It's from another place. I'm far above anything that's been established by man. And what Jesus wants to win is he wants his church to win. Fast forward several months from now, November the 5th, we're going to have an election and a candidate will win based on what happens on November the 5th. I don't know if you guys realize that. But based on our voting and, and the way our democracy works, a candidate's going to win on November 5th. But the church will win based on our actions before, during, and after November the 5th. And what Jesus says when he was on the earth is that if we're going to be a part of this thing that Jesus is a part of, this thing that he wants to win in this season, then we've got to be honest to both extremes, to both parties, that we have to evaluate as a church our actions during this season to make sure we're understanding our role as primarily a part of the kingdom of God that's greater than any other kingdom the world has to offer. It's bigger than the election. The kingdom of God, I don't know if you know this, it's bigger than who's voted in. It's bigger than the Supreme Court. And while all those things are like, they're vitally important to what we do as Americans, we got to be reminded that we're part of something bigger. We're a part of something, God, we're a part of God's kingdom. It's bigger than America. And the world is looking at us. He's looking at, the, the world is looking at the church to see our actions, to watch how we love people, to watch how responsible we are, to watch our ability to care and stay focused on Jesus even when everything else is not. No matter which candidate wins, Jesus wants the church to win. So much so that before Jesus was betrayed, before the night that, that all of this happened, just hours before he stood before Pilate, Jesus sat with his disciples. And he sat with his disciples, and, and it's, it's the night he was betrayed, it's at the Last Supper, and they're sitting in the upper room, and Jesus talks to them, and he gave them a challenge. In fact, it's, it's the final prayer that Jesus prayed on the earth. Really, this is the true Lord's Prayer, if you want to get down to it. And Jesus, in the middle of a polarized, divisive, politicized world, Jesus says to his disciples what I think he would say to us if he were to speak to us in the middle of our polarized, political, divisive world. He says this to him in John chapter 17. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, Lord. He's saying to, to, to the church, to you and me, it's not that I want to take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. Now, the evil one is not Biden. The evil one is not Trump. We're in a world where our battle, the Bible says, is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is a spiritual battle. It's bigger than any political battle that could be fought on the earth. He goes on and he says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Remember, we, we, we look like Jesus. Jesus is not of this world, and neither are we if we call ourselves followers of him. In verse 17, it's, he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. He sent us into the area that we're in with a big cause and with a big purpose. And we'll tell you what, during a season like we're in right now, when, when politics keep drama high, guess what? The light of the church has the opportunity to shine the brightest. In verse 20, he says, my prayer is not for them alone. But I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. He's praying this over his disciples. He says, everyone who comes after them and believes in the message of, of my grace and truth after them, 
This prayer is for them too. Guess what that means? He's praying for you. He's praying for me. He's praying for Life Point Church. And he goes on and he says, my prayer is for them that when they believe that all of them may be Republicans. Oh, no, my bad, my bad. That all of them may be Democrats. Is that, not, is that not what my version says? No. That all of them may be one. That all of them may be one. In other words, that all of God's church would be unified. And then he says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. It's the prayer of Jesus, the prayer that he prayed for us, is that in this political climate, in this political season, he wants us to be in it, but he wants us to be unified in the middle of it. So much so that he says, there's a world that's watching, and they're going to shape their opinions about me by the way you behave. Not just at the polls, but also on social media, and also when you're hanging out with your buddies at Bojangles, right? That's how they're going to, like, determine who I am. So as a part of the church, as the church that Jesus wants to win, as the one that he is part of the party of the church, what do we do? How do we behave in a divided political world? How are we supposed to act? I've got three thoughts that come straight out of the Bible that I think God gives us to show us, hey, this is how we're supposed to think and behave in the middle of a season like we're in. Here's the first one, is that as a part of Jesus' church, we are Christians first and we're American citizens second. We're Christians first, and we're American citizens second. And we'll say it again for everybody in the back. We're Christians first, we're American citizens second. Here's what that doesn't mean. It does not mean that we're not proud of our country. It does not mean that we don't like take the responsibility serious. It doesn't mean that we don't, can't be a part of a political party. What it means is that we never take for granted the fact that while America is amazing, while the, the freedoms that we have are amazing, to speak, speak freely, to worship freely, to start businesses, to create wealth, to make an impact and a difference, to have as many children as you want, something our Leland family has taken massive advantage of, right? We've got all of these freedoms, and while those matter, we love and we honor our country, and we're thankful for the country we live in. Listen, I need to say this to you, and, and don't get mad, don't rush the stage, but America is not the promised land. We love America. Don't say Amen. I don't want you to get beaten up too. America is not God's only. America is not God's chosen people. We're not his favorite people. I just need to say this. It's incredibly arrogant. It's incredibly small-minded. It's incredibly self-centered to think that God's world revolves around us. God's world is much bigger than ours, and we are not the center of the universe. The scripture says it this way in the, the Gospel of John. Most of you have this verse memorized. For God so loved the, yeah. For God so loved the world. And the idea for us to take away is that while we're loyal to our country, we worship a different king. We love America and we're loyal to our country, but we worship a completely different king. And those of us who are followers in Jesus, we're proud to be Americans, but we have a deeper loyalty and a higher calling. In fact, if you look in the scripture, I want to read you a verse that kind of highlights this higher calling. It's in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and it says it this way. It says, but you, the church, you, everyone at every one of our campuses today, it says you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. What an amazing verse. You just need to like read that over your lives sometimes, that you are these things. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You're set apart for something. You're God's special possession. And the reason, he says, is you're all of those things so that you may get your favorite candidate elected into the seat that you want him to be in. Get your policy and your agenda across, like get, uh, win a fight on social media. That's why you're God's chosen people. No. He says the reason that we're God's chosen people, the, the why behind it is so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Sometimes, guys, I am worried that we are way more American than we are Christian. Can I just be honest with you? Like, in our actions and what we put on Facebook and the way we fight for our candidate or our policy, if we campaign for Jesus near as much as we do for the other two guys, I think our world would be changed. You see, we're Christians 
first. We're Americans, we're Republicans, we're Democrats, second. It is not our primary identity. And if you look at politics through your primary identity, I'm gonna tell you what you'll do. You'll treat people different. You'll post differently. You'll never unfriend somebody uh, as a Christian because they've disagreed with something that you've said in a secondary or a third level of identity in your life. And that's what our nationalism is. It's secondary. It's third level. It is not the primary identity. We're Christians first. We proclaim Jesus first and we're followers of Jesus first. And we're Americans second. I ran across this uh, in studying this week, I ran across a, a, a way to illustrate this, and I thought it was interesting. It was from the nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty. Some of you guys remember that, all right? That is not in the Bible, all right? Just so you know, Humpty Dumpty is not in the Bible, but it's an old nursery rhyme, and it simply goes like this. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great what? Fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't do what? They couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And Mr. Dumpty's world had become shattered, and he needed to get it fixed, right? But here's what Mr. Dumpty didn't do. He didn't go to his friends. He didn't go to his family. He didn't even go to his church. Here's where Mr. Dumpty went. He went to the White House. And we know that he went to the White House because the king got involved. And the king was sympathetic to Mr. Dumpty's dilemma. So he called a meeting of Congress. And we know that Congress got involved because all the king's men got involved. And when they came together, they decided to pass a fix Mr. Dumpty law. Because sincerely... They wanted to make Mr. Dumpty's world a whole lot better place to live. But the tragedy of the nursery rhyme is that when all was said and done, after the laws had been passed and Congress had been involved and the White House was involved, all the king's horses and all the king's men still could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And what's so unfortunate for us today is that as believers in Jesus, too many believers are expecting the solutions to our problems to land on Air Force One. And what you and I need to understand is that when we expect the transformations to come from our elected officials, we are going to fall terribly short because our hope does not land in the White House. It does not live on Pennsylvania Avenue. Our hope was born in a manger, and our hope hung on a cross, and our hope was risen from an empty tomb. We need to understand that potentially our concern does not need to be so much who's in the White House, but who is in our house. Who is in the house that you live in? Who is in the house that we worship in? Is Jesus alive in our house, or as our primary citizenship to a country that's been created by the best efforts of men that one day will fall at the feet of Jesus. Our primary citizenship is to heaven. It's the kingdom of God. And then it's to our country. Here's number two. You guys still love me? Good. <laughs> number two. As a part of Jesus' church, change happens by our actions, not our opinions. Change happens by our actions, not our opinions. And listen, I, here's what I know is some of you guys are spiritual gift, spiritually gifted with opinions. Me too. Me too. But what we have to really come, come to terms with is that you and I have an opportunity, and our opportunity to express our opinion through action is by voting. So the question comes up is, how should you vote? Well, the first thing I just want to say to you all is that you should vote. I do want to say that up front. One of the privileges that we have is to vote. Between 30, I read this recently. Between 35 and 60% of eligible Americans do not vote. Many times because we think that one vote isn't going to make that big of a difference. Unfortunately, I've read only 25% of Christians vote. That means there are 25 million voices that don't speak up. My challenge to you is speak up. For some of you guys, this is actually your first election that you have the opportunity to vote in. You're a younger person in our church. And can I just say to you, hey, wrap your arms around that. Take advantage of that. This is your opportunity to use your voice to make a difference. And your action of voting is a whole lot more powerful than your opinion. But before you vote, here's just a few things I want to encourage you to do before you vote. Ready? The first thing is this. You can take notes on this. The first thing is pray for those who are running for office. Pray for them. The Bible actually says it this way. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible says, I urge you then, first of all, everybody say first of all. First of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And then they specify all people even more. And he says, especially for kings and all of those in authority. When's the last time we prayed for President Biden? When's the last time we prayed for Donald Trump? You know, praying for candidates is a great way to demonstrate and exercise your faith. And you're actually less likely to tear someone down after you've lifted them up in prayer. Prayer may not change them, 
But prayer may change you. Pray for your candidates. Here's the second thing, is do your homework. Just do your homework. Proverbs 18, chapter, uh, chapter 18, verse 13 says that to answer before listening, that is folly and shame. Essentially, to jump to conclusions before doing your homework, that's foolish. And can I just give y'all, this is a little revolution to you, uh, revelatory to you guys. Not everything on social media is true. I'm sorry. I know you thought it was. Mainstream media, they're biased. Fox News, CNN, they're going to tell you different things. Most of them are going to, some of them are going to tell you what you want to hear. Your Facebook feed is probably telling you what you want to hear. It's feeding what you want to hear. So we have to create some separation between us and an echo chamber that's saying the same thing we want to hear. So how do we do that? There's a couple of resources I want to give to you. Just a couple of tools for you to check out. Here's the first one. It's a website. It's called isidewith.com. isidewith.com. isidewith.com is a, pol- is a survey through political issues where you... You actually go in and put in like, this is where I stand on this issue, and this is where I stand on this policy. And at the end of it, it will tell you the candidate who most aligns with your beliefs. Hey, I I did this again this week. I was surprised at my results that I got from it. The next uh, website is myfaithvotes.com. Myfaithvotes.com. And what this does is it takes some of the big issues and it asks, what does the Bible actually have to say about this issue? Before you go in and vote, Before you express an opinion, pray for candidates and do your homework. And then here's the third one, is apply biblical insight. Apply biblical insight. As a Christian, I don't squeeze biblical principles into my life. I build my life on biblical principles. The Word of God is the greatest foundation for our nation. And I'm way less concerned about popular opinion and political opinion. I'm more concerned about what the Bible says about issues. Does either candidate walk out their faith? Do the policies reflect biblical values? And policies that are important to us, just so you know, are, are views on marriage. Are they biblical? Uh, views on the unborn or birth, birth and abortion. Are they biblical? Views on caring for the poor. Views on immigration, on a gender equality. Those are just a few. Are they biblical views and policies that a candidate represents. And hey, once you've prayed for a candidate, once you've, like, you've researched, once you've applied biblical principles, then go and vote. But as I was thinking about voting, I was taken to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5 to me is a great lens to see voting responsibility through. Joshua essentially has been doing reconnaissance work around the walls of Jericho, for those of you who are familiar with the story in the Bible. And he's trying to figure out how to take down his enemy. And he looks over as he's doing this recon work, and he sees the captain of another large army. And this captain is dressed in in battle array. And here's Joshua. Joshua's mama didn't raise no dummy. Joshua wanted to know, and he asked this captain of the, the, the army, he said, hey, whose side are you on? Essentially, he was saying, whose side are you on, our side or are you on the enemy's side? Because if you're on our side, then we've got some help against Jericho. But if you're on the other side, we got double trouble because you're a big boy. He says, before I go out, make a fool out of myself, I need to know whose side are you on. And the captain of this army says to him, I think, I think you're a little confused. I'm neither on your side, nor am I on their side. And then he says this, I'm the captain of the Lord's army. And he references what Pastor Tony Evans said at the beginning. I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over. What you and I need to understand is that God does not ride on the backs of donkeys or elephants. If you're a Democrat, here's the best thing that you can do is vote Democrat light, L-I-T-E. If you're a Republican, best thing you can do is vote Republican light, L-I-T-E. Because your job and my job is to bring either party that we're a part of the light. L-I-G-H-T, the light of Jesus. It's not to be so sold out on our party that we can't be sold out for him. Our job is to represent another king and another kingdom, and it's to represent him well. So as the church, where do we go from here? If all this is true, what do we do? Well, the final point is this, is as Jesus' church, our goal is not total agreement, but total love. Our goal is not total agreement, but total love. One of the qualities I love about LifePoint Church across every campus is the diversity that has developed over the years at our church. Our church, as with every church, should reflect its community. And when you look across 
Life Point Church and all of our campuses. There are various age groups and races and uh, economic standings and political views that are represented. And the goal of a church should never be to get everybody in total agreement about every issue. It's just never going to happen. But as long as Jesus is the focus, the goal of the church is to keep him the focus. And as long as we have cookies without raisins in it for our senior pastor, then we're going to be a church family that can get along. Jesus actually prays it this way to take you back to, uh, to John chapter 17. He says, I have given them the glory, listen to this, I've given them the glory that you gave me. He's talking about you, he's talking about me. He's talking about the church. And he says, I've given them the same glory that you've given me, Lord. And he says, I in them and you in me, listen to this, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Will you say those with me, every campus? Complete unity, your turn. Complete unity. Jesus says, my glory is in them. When people see them, they see me. And my prayer for them is that they would be in complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and you have loved me even as you've loved, you've loved them even as you've loved me. Here's what Jesus is saying is that our unity will be proof of his reality. Our ability to live unified as a church, it's proof of his reality. What does it say to an unbelieving world if Jesus' followers can't get along with each other? Across every campus, if, if you're a Republican who's here, we love you, we care for you, we pray for you, and what your call is as a Republican is to love and to care and to pray for your Democratic brothers and sisters. If you're a Democrat who's here, we love and we care for and we pray for you, and what your main responsibility is is to love and to care and pray for your Republican brothers and sisters. We don't unfriend them. We don't talk about them. We don't tell them they're ignorant. We don't tell them that they, were, they are dumb. We love one another. We live in complete unity. It is the thing that we will fight for. We tell everyone who comes on our staff and we tell everyone who comes on our volunteer team, the number one job description, number one bullet point on your job description is to guard, to fight for the unity of the church because it is what an unbelieving world sees when they look at you and I. I have a, a younger brother, uh, Andy, and Andy has been in the Air Force for years. And about seven years ago, he ended up in, in Washington, D.C., and he went on staff at Arlington Cemetery. He was a part of the National Honor Guard there. It's pretty amazing what he got to do. And, and after many years of that, Andy be actually became a chaplain at Arlington National Cemetery, which is currently what he does for a living. And it's really interesting, every day Andy sits with grieving families and he officiates funeral services for veterans and, and each funeral service that he officiates, he'll talk to the families and to anyone who's in attendance about the values and freedoms that our nation has, the values and freedoms that were defended by the veteran who's actually being buried. But as Andy talks about this, the most prevalent mark of identity that he points out to the people who are there is actually found on the tombstone, the headstone that marks every grave. And he points out how on every gravestone, prominently at the top, above the names, above anything else, prominently carved in the top of each grave marker is not a flag, but it's a cross. And Andy actually, I wrote down what he would, will say, he has this in every uh, uh, ceremony that he officiates, is that he likes to highlight the cross during this uh, ceremony, and he says something to the effect of this. He says, the banner that he defended in life, the flag, grants him this place to rest. But the banner that he defended, that, but the banner that defended him, the cross, secures him a home to reside. Our primary citizenship is that we are members of the kingdom of heaven. And we're American second. So, as members of the kingdom of heaven, can I give you a commission today? For those in here who are Republicans, for those of you who are Democrats, for those of you who don't fit into either of those categories, above all that, I want to give you a commission. And it comes straight out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. It says this. It says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. When it says we are therefore, you could actually underline that and put your name there. John is Christ's ambassador. Kevin is Christ's ambassador. 
Susan is Christ's ambassador. Whoever you are, wherever you are, if you bowed your uh, knee and you proclaimed Jesus as Lord, you are one of Christ's ambassadors. Before we're anything else, we represent him. It says, we're therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Can I give you a commission today? Can we get back on the campaign trail this week to make Jesus famous? In our workplaces, in our homes, in our lives, in our friendships, can we get back to the place that says, Jesus, ultimately, the one that we campaign for the most, the one that our lives and our demeanor and our tone and the way that we live and exercise our rights, the, the one that we honor and that we represent in all of that, Jesus, is not just a country that we love, but it's a God that we worship. Can we put him back in the place where he belongs? Because here, here's the reason why. is because if our goal is just to get someone elected, then four to eight years from now, we're gonna be in the same issues that we're having today. They're not gonna go away. I've been through a lot of elections in my life and what I've seen is over every one of them, when the person that I wanted to won and when the person that I wanted to lost, with every one, I, I feel like it really doesn't change that much. We find ourselves back in the same issue in the same fight every four to eight years. But if our goal will become to make Jesus famous, then the people who meet him their issues won't circle back every four years or every eight years because when they meet him, they are forever changed and forever transformed. He is the only solution to whatever we are going through. As an individual, as a, as a nation, as a church, he is the only solution. So may we be people. May we be a church. May we be people who understand that our primary focus is to make Jesus famous in every area of our lives. Can we commit to that again? Can we get back on the campaign trail for that one more time across every campus? Can we come back to the place where we say, Jesus, I wanna make you famous. I wanna make you more famous than anything else that I'm campaigning for on social media or beyond. And while I love my country and I love the rights that I get to have Jesus at the end of the day, it is all for you, it is all from you, and God, it will eventually all go back to you. And so I wanna be a part of making Jesus king and being the best ambassador for him that I can. Is anybody else at any of our campuses with me on that? Can we do that? Can we bow our heads? Let's close our eyes. We're going to pray. Jesus, we come to you right now. We thank you. Lord, we thank you for the country that we live in. We're grateful for it. May we never take that for granted. May we never take the freedoms that we have for granted. We are genuinely humbled and grateful by it. But Lord, we understand. And may our lives echo the words of our King that my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus, ultimately, above every president, above every official, above every policy, Jesus, you stand as king. And Lord, may we be ambassadors worthy of carrying your name into a broken world, into a world that is looking for hope to land in an election and as a result of a ballot box, God, may we carry the real hope, the hope that will never fade away, the hope that is living, the hope of Jesus to our world. Now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if, if you're at any of our campuses today, and maybe that hope of Jesus is not landed in your life yet. Maybe you're still living a life that's distant or separate from him, and you have not received his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness in your life. Today can be your day for that. And if that's you across every campus, I wanna lead you in a prayer. And, and you can pray these words along with me. There's no magic in these words, but I just wanna invite you to use them as a guide for you to have a conversation with Jesus this morning. Let's pray together. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of my past, of my sin. Say it this way, Jesus, forgive me of keeping you at arm's distance in my life. And then say, Jesus, today I surrender my life to you. And I invite you into my life to bring your kingdom into my life, to be my forgiver, my leader, my Lord, my Savior. And say this to him one more time, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Now, with no one looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed across our campuses, if you made that decision today, we would love to know about it. 
And your host will come in a few minutes and tell you a couple of next steps. But the first thing we want to do is we want you to let us know. And there's a simple way we're going to do that is I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand high and to leave your hand in the air. One of our uh, host team from your campus uh, is going to come around and they're going to place a card in your hand and your host will tell you what to do with that after we're done. But if that's you, would you raise your hand after we, get, we count to three today? You ready? One, two, three. If you made that decision to follow Jesus today, would you just slip your hand up across every campus? We'll give it a, we'll give it a few seconds. I see at Pine Valley Campus, there's a hand up right here in the second row. We want to get them something across every campus. Let's give it a few more seconds. All right, you can put your hands down and will everybody at every LifePoint campus put your hands together and congratulate them.